James Terrell is here. His work as an artist explores perception, light, color, and space. Chuck Close has said of him he's an orchestrator of experience, not a creator of cheap effects. And every artist knows how cheap an effect is and how revolutionary an experience. The first major museum show in New York since 1980 is currently on view at the Guggenheim Museum. It features a major new project called Atten Rain. The Guggenheim is transformed into an enormous volume filled with shifting artificial and natural light. I am pleased to have James Terrell at this table for the first time. Welcome. What Thank a pleasure you. it is to have you here. It's terrific to be here. Now, you've got three exhibitions at the same time? Actually, more than that. Oh. Uh, one, there's... Big ones, though. Yes, yes, large ones. Is that... Three, three museum shows. Was that planned that way? Yes. In, in order to do what? Achieve what? Well, uh, after 48 years of working, uh, to do a retrospective, I'm representing it with only 23 works. Yeah. So that would normally be done with more works as a painter or most other artists. So uh, this is just a work that luxuriates in space and uses up quite a bit of it. So it took three museums to do that. When, when, let me go back to the beginning. Um, growing up, Quaker family? Quaker family, yes. N not much in, in your own family a sense of art is as crucial to... Life. No, Wilburites don't don't believe in art. Think it's a vanity. Yeah, of course, vanity. Now, Art's a vanity. Yes, of course. Now seeing you know art fairs and auction prices and all this, maybe it is. It is. Yes. So, yeah. so um, how did you escape from that into this perception of light and its thingness? A word I want you to describe for me. Thingness that it occupies space, that it has presence, that it is uh, something that you feel to yeah. be there. Um, not it's, a, it's a thing into itself. It's not just something that you use to observe something else. Photon has mass. So yeah. it is something. It is passing through rather quickly. So yeah. I do make these spaces that seem to apprehend light for our perception. And these are spaces that both protect it and in some way form it. But it is light you're looking at. Light in the space. And when did you discover that this was what made you most curious? curious from being a child. I mean, everybody really? has, I mean, they even test, you know, your response right. to light. And so, and children are fascinated by it. And perhaps I never grew out of it. It's like but you never grew out of it. Yeah. Because most children don't go and become an artist of light. Well, it's just also most children don't become a fireman because they, they exactly. love that when they're young too. Right. But some do. Right. Some do. But was so. there a moment? Was there an object? Was there something that said, wow, this is how I want to spend my life? That was kind of all along, sort of a bit of an, ass an assumption, but yeah. it was only as it became possible to do this in art that it became that important. And that was sort of, uh, it came about in college and came from very good teachers. James Demetrian, who was at the Hirshhorn most recently, but before right, that right. was at, at Des Moines Art Center, and before that at Passy Art Museum, and before that a teacher at Pomona College, though only two years, and I happened to be there those two years. And you once said, the world is not one we receive, but one we create. Well, that's the other thing, is that we're quite unaware of how much that we perceive we are a part of creating. Yeah. That we are co-creators. I mean, this is something that, of course, you, you hear about in Eastern philosophies or now even in uh, you know, subatomic particle physics where essentially we're finding what we're looking for, which has to do with perhaps even making it. These are things that I think are really important today and are very interesting. But how much of the world that we assume um, is, is amazing. We have prejudiced perception or, or ways of seeing that we have ways of perceiving that we have actually formed that may not actually be that way or don't necessarily have to and be so that way. And so you want us to understand what? Well, uh, that we are part of creating that which we think we perceive. Right, right. Just that... Just that little part. And so, of course, this is different in every piece. Sometimes you're successful in doing that, other times not so. But um, I do a work that tends to, to go around that point. Is the Guggenheim the perfect place for you? It's a difficult place. Oh, but is it, does the nature it offer you possibilities other places might not? The staff, um, that is those who, who do the work and the director and the curators there, 
they gave me the opportunity. Yeah. Because that, that has, it's, it's what you want to do and how much you can involve yourself in doing and how much they're willing to spend and take on and what risk they're able to to, to take on that's really important. Yeah. But what I love about it, and this is me as a journalist, what I love is the idea of the Guggenheim is where uh, Frank Lloyd Wright meets James Terrell. Or I meet Frank. Or you meet Frank Lloyd Wright. Yes. 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 And it, it, I think it's a rather glorious combination. I do too. And that's I, my point. <laughs> and I think, he, <laughs> I think he would like it. Uh, as Richard Armstrong said, the red phone on his desk that goes directly to Frank did not ring. <laughs> <laughs> did not ring at all. Right. Yeah. And I think that there have been other uh, projects that may have been in there where, where people wondered about that. Mm -hmm. where they yeah. It is, though, your work is not easily photographed. Well, someone has to make up for all the work that's photographed better than it is. Yeah, exactly. So you're so. doing something where the experience is better than the photograph. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, it's rather flat. It photographs rather flat. Obviously, also when it photographs, you can't tell whether it's standing up vertically oh, yeah. or... Just how it how it works that but way. But this is what Chuck Close meant. It's an experience. Yes. You it, provide an experience. Yes. And people fall down even. Oh no. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well we don't want to go that, there. That has, that has happened and, yeah. and uh, did influence a lot of what I how I would show things in the U.S. Because, what do you mean? Um, that was at the Whitney show right, where someone right, did. Right. Uh, actually, there were two. One dove into a piece thinking yeah. it would be soft, and uh, the other actually fell back against something yeah. that she thought was a wall, it was going to be a wall. I mean, her testimony is yeah. there was this wall, actually it was the receding wall, I leaned against it, and it wasn't there. Yeah. So that, that did happen. And uh, that, in a way, I stopped having pieces that people then walked through in the U.S., and mm -hmm. so it left them for Asia and for... Mm -hmm. um, do you find it difficult or easy for you, because you are an artist and, and words do come to you, uh, and the command of language is yours, but nevertheless, it's difficult to describe what you do? I try to stay away from that because it's made the for... The for itself. Yes, made, yes. And so, uh, but it, it, I did find uh, some difficulty in trying to do this with uh, Patrick Lannan and the Lannan Foundation, who supported the initial work at the crater, we went over and over and over everything that was happening. Each piece was being built. He spent quite a bit of money there and was amazingly helpful. And then there was this time that he, things were done. He brought out the, the board to see it. Yes. We went through it. They were thrilled. He pulled me aside and he said, you know, "Why didn't you tell me this was your building?" I said, "I thought I did." Yeah. And so those things you, you do come up against uh, the reality of how good your descriptive process is. I, I, I was alluding to this earlier in your own discovery of all this, and I was thinking about your aunt, Frances Hodges. Yes. Well, she, she played a huge role. Well, she was Seventeen Magazine and, yeah. and then was part of the, the making of Mademoiselle later. So she was sort of my Auntie Mame. Yeah. She lived at you, number four Gramercy Park. Right. We're now at number two. But she had the whole, yeah. the whole building. But she introduced you to the world of New York. Yes, also Thomas Wilford. But uh, she meant to introduce me to, of course, the, uh, the, the beautiful Monet water lilies, which yeah. were amazing in how much they subtended of our vision. And did they speak to you? Absolutely, they did. And all, But there was this Thomas Wilford there, who was this strange guy yeah. who made this light in a box kind of thing. And I thought, well, you know, that looks like our time. Yeah. And I, that was the big thing, is, is just something that was our, you know, what we do, what we're doing now. And of course, for me, painting was European. Um, coming from Los Angeles, we'd, we'd see photographs of art you see it in the slideshow yeah but you have to remember that the Mona Lisa was projected to the same dimension as Barnett Newman's who's afraid of yellow right right so so sometimes when I saw the actual things they seemed small and not very luminous that was I, I, I did feel that sometimes but uh, that's how I got culture and of course culture is very different in Los Angeles that's a, that's a town that's an entertainment town it's yeah. not culture right and I've always thought that Las Vegas is kind of what L.A. wanted to be on its day off. <laughs> <laughs> and I now have a piece in in uh, Las Vegas at, yeah. at the uh, Louis Vuitton. You were saying that Las Vegas Friday. is what L.A. wanted to be on its day off. Absolutely. Right. Yes. right. That's, that's how it always seemed to me. So it was a town that didn't really worry about having taste. Yeah. And that is strangely freeing, too, because, you know... Um, 
Taste is constriction. Taste yeah. is restriction. Yeah, it's, and if you assume that, if you know that, or if you feel that, then you can just. You but you know, could do what you wanted. Unbounded. Yeah, you, you could do what you wanted there, and you know, you come here and you feel culture having been made already. Yeah. That's not true in the time I was growing up in L.A. You, you are at the first rank of American artist. I mean, I'll tell you that. You know that, but you may be modest about it. Um, what is it that you perceive, that, what is it that we want to understand about your genius? And, and pardon the use of these words, about front rank and genius. But what is it that, that you hope we get about what you are about? Well, the joy of sensing, which is the sensual. And that's often missed in, in sort of descriptions of my work, that it's quite sensual yeah. and even emotional. Um, and that I like about it, but um, you know, mo it has more to do with in, uh, the description has more to do with describing how it happens or how it comes about or what it is. Um, that doesn't seem to bother me yeah. much. And what's the hardest about it, the creation, for you? Oh, uh, you know, working with light is. Uh, but is it the idea or the execution? It's the execution. Yeah. The execution. Ideas and thoughts are are cheap you know you can you can have many of them but it's actually pulling it off actually making these things realizing them and that you, you know as an artist you have to manifest you, you don't get you don't get to count the things you haven't done but that you thought of that were terrific yeah 